Would you pray with me as we continue in worship this morning? Father, you, you know us better than we know ourselves. And so I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit, that you would reveal to us what we need to see about ourselves and about the greatness of the glory of Jesus and how that specifically applies to our lives. So to that end, would you, would you care for us now? Would you lead us by your Spirit? And would you minister to places that we can't even reach within our own hearts? Help us to see the greatness of your plan of redemption fulfilled through this particular scene in Matthew's gospel. And I pray that you would do this by the power of your spirit and in the name of our good and gracious King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, since we had a week off last week from our study of Matthew because Greg, Greg Kolkel was here and was preaching from Jude and Second Timothy, I think it would be helpful to just kind of reorient ourselves to where we are. Uh, also because we're in kind of a, a break. There's a shift in Matthew's gospel because Jesus has now arrived in Jerusalem. So let's just take a moment to... Remember that Matthew is narrating a story which serves as a historical account of the life and ministry of Jesus, and he's showcasing many specific fulfillments, many specific promises from the Old Testament, and showing how they actually are fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. The first couple of chapters of Matthew's gospel gives us the highlights of his early life before he's baptized, tempted by the devil, and and begins his teaching and healing ministry. Once he calls his first disciples and then begins ministering to great crowds, his his three-year ministry then is summarized in about 15 chapters of Matthew's account. Beginning with today's verses, the story slows way down. And this is true for all of the gospel writers. Matthew will now essentially take eight chapters to describe the last eight days of Jesus' life. Who is this Jesus? This is the question that Matthew has desired that we would grapple with as we observe him and the way his authority is exercised over disease, and over demons, over natural disasters, and even over death itself. Through his miracles and through his teaching, we've seen that he is, he is no ordinary man. As he arrives in Jerusalem, it becomes clear that he is on no ordinary mission either. So whether you've been with us all along through our study of Matthew's gospel, or whether this is the first time you've been here, or maybe it's the first time you've been in church for a long, long time, let's look together at the glory of Jesus revealed in this scene. As we behold the reactions to his arrival, to this man calmly riding into the city on a donkey, which is stirring up the entire city, let's ask the same question that the original eyewitnesses asked on that day as he rode into town. And that is, who is this man? Our passage is Matthew 21, verses 1 through 11. Hear the word of God, brothers and sisters. Now, when they drew near to 
Jerusalem and came to Bethpage to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village in front of you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put them put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. Lord, would you lead us now? Help us to see the glory of your Son revealed here, we ask in his name. Amen. Who is this? Now, we might be able to answer rather quickly, well, it's, it's Jesus. We've been thinking about this and, and learning this for you know, over a year now. But may the Holy Spirit actually help us to think through the reality of who Jesus actually is as it relates to this particular scene. Many of his attributes are on display here. So we might walk through our passage like this. In verses 1 through, th- one through 3, we see that Jesus is revealed as the Lord of all creation. In verses 4 and 5, he is the promised king. In 6 and 7, he is the prince of peace. In 8 and 9, he is the suffering savior And if you think about it, I'm giving you the answers before the question, right? A great habit for teachers to do, at least when I was a student, I loved it. They ask, who is this? Verses 10 and 11. Now, I think that the essence of the passage is is straightforward and, and can be summarized simply. And that is, because of who Jesus is, he is worthy of worship. Because remember, they're asking the question, who is this? Because of who he is, he is worthy of worship. And in fact, that's exactly what we see the people doing when he walks into town. They begin praising him. Now, the reason that the gospel writers slow down their narratives, starting with the triumphal entry, is so that we can consider the magnitude of what is happening as it unfolds. Because this, this week in the life of Jesus is not just the climax of Matthew's particular account. This is the week, this week in the life of Jesus is the week that God had declared would eventually come all the way back in Genesis 3 and verse 15, when he said to Satan, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. At the conclusion of this specific week in the life of Jesus, the serpent's head will be crushed through the cross and resurrection. Promise made in the Old Testament promise kept through Jesus in the new. There isn't one millisecond of redemptive history where Satan had the upper hand. This is God's plan unfolding. Now, as we press into the very first few verses, 
Note that, that powerful truths emerge through very subtle details. It kind of reminds me of when God spoke to Moses through the burning bush. Moses saw the bush and, and it wasn't consumed. And it was this unusual phenomena that got Moses' attention. When he turned to, aside to see what the deal was, that is when God spoke to him. Now, why did God do it this way? I don't know. I mean, how many other distracting things could there possibly be in the middle of the wilderness where he's tending sheep? I don't know. But, but here's the reality. He orchestrated a normal event, the burning of a bush, but with a twist to make the point to Moses that something extraordinary is occurring among the ordinary if you have eyes to see it. In this situation, Jesus describes something about as ordinary as you can get. Walking into town and finding a donkey and a colt tied up. And he gives instruction about what to do if the disciples are confronted. He says, say, the, the Lord needs it. It will be sent at once. Now, this, this scene is so understated, especially by Matthew, because all four of the gospel writers mention the triumphal entry. But this is, is so understated by Matthew that he, he doesn't even mention that what Jesus said would happen actually happens here. It kind of recalls chapter 17. If you remember when Jesus told Peter to go cast a, a line into the sea and draw out the first fish, and that first fish that you see, reach in there, grab a shekel, and pay for your temple tax and for mine. And then he never actually says that that's what Peter did. But the assumption is, given what has been revealed about Jesus up to this point, that's exactly what Peter did, and it played out exactly as Jesus said. And that's, that's the same assumption here, I think, that Matthew, Matthew is operating under. Why would it play out that way? Because he is the Lord over all creation, as he has shown multiple times already in his gospel. He's the Lord of owners of animals. He's the Lord of animals. He's the Lord of time and chronology and detail. He knows exactly what is going to happen. And in fact, it does. Subtly, but beautifully, we see the sovereignty of God on display. Now, if I was listening to this account of Matthew, real time, the first time it happened, I know how I would be reacting. I'd be going, hold on, slow down. So Jesus said what? And then that played out exactly like that? And Matthew would say, yes. And I'd say, that's awesome. And I'd be looking for people to fist bump and be like, do you see what's happening here with Jesus? And I think Matthew would say, sit down. It's awesome, but we're used to this by now. It's not the main point of the story, so stay tuned here. And so when you think about it, as you process God doing extremely subtle but incredible miracles, and I'm not even really sure, does it work to say subtle and miracle together? I'm not sure if that's a good juxtaposition, but in this case, think about your own life. Has God done what we're calling subtle miracles in your own life? That is, things that may not stand out as extraordinary among the more ordinary occurrences of every day, but things nonetheless that were direct answers to prayer. I remember a particular month, probably more than 10 years ago, where we had had some unusual expenses, some medical bills and things from surgeries that we were paying off. And Christy and I were sitting at the kitchen table and we were going over our finances and thinking we must have made a mistake because we were $1,700 short just that month. And we looked at each other with the same thought, we don't have it. There's no way that we can make our finances for this particular month. So I got up and I walked through the living room and I was heading out the front door. And as I opened the door, a courier letter fell out of the door. 
And I picked it up, and it was an escrow refund check for $1,700. And I went back in and showed it to Christy. We just kind of looked at each other and just started crying and saying, of course our Father is providing for us. Of course he has demonstrated his faithfulness again. Now, I don't know if that's subtle or not in this particular case, but how many other prayers which seem very ordinary does he answer? Think about having a hard day with your kids and you're praying as they're sleeping before you go to bed tonight. Lord, would you soften their hearts? Would you soften their hearts towards you and toward one another in the morning? And then they've awoken with joy instead of hardness, or maybe a tenderness that wasn't there the day before. And you just kind of go about the day and shepherd them. And maybe don't even realize this is the Holy Spirit at work bearing down on the hearts of our children. Thousands of times I have prayed for wisdom as a parent and as a shepherd. Thousands of times in conversations. Thousands of times in praying in sermon preparation. And sometimes God answers those prayers so quickly and so subtly, so instantaneously, in fact, that I almost pass it off as not even needing prayer. I've been so stuck on something before and looked at it and said, Lord, would you illumine my mind? Would you, Spirit, would you show me what you want me to, sh- what you want me to see? Oh, wait, never mind. I already got it. And then I thought, oh, you're kidding me. It's, that's more of a reflection of my own heart than anything else, but it's incredible. Just think about how many prayers God has answered in your own life when the supernatural meets your everyday life. I'll bet it's in the 10,000s if you're a believer. May we not take his glorious grace For granted, but the the main point of our passage is simple. Because of who Jesus is, he is worthy of worship. Jesus proves who he is over and over and over again. So he is worthy of ongoing worship over and over and over again. So this week as families and this week in growth group, it would be a good use of time to recall and to think about and to share ways in which God has demonstrated his ongoing work in our lives. And then don't just share, but pause. And as is the main point of our passage, worship him for who he is and what he continues to do in your lives. Now, verses 4 and 5 reveal an extraordinary reality This took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. So the details that are unfolding in this account are unfolding in a way that fulfills ancient prophecy written more than 500 years before it occurred. Matthew's point here is that these ordinary events are fulfilling God's promise given through the prophet Zechariah. Matthew streamlines the details and emphasizes that the king who is coming, the king who has arrived in Jerusalem, is is humble. Now, just let that reality fall on you for a moment. That Jesus is humble would be remarkable enough if he were merely a human king. But given the reality that he is also the Lord of all creation, the second person of the Trinity makes Jesus stunningly attractive to those who are broken and those who are rebellious. Jesus doesn't just act humbly. Jesus is humble, according to Matthew and Zechariah. The Lord of all 
creation. The king of glory, the beloved son of God is, is humble, is lowly of heart, is meek. Winston Churchill once described an opponent as a humble man with a good deal to be humble about. (laughs) Jesus is a humble man with a good deal not to be humble about. Speaking personally as a man with a good deal to be humble about, but who is often not humble. I find the humility of Jesus devastatingly humbling. I remember once, uh, I think my senior year, uh, so shortly after I came to Christ, I was praying with a small small group of Christians. I I don't remember specifically the context of what we were praying about, but I I remember praying something about God giving us humility or, or something of that nature. The the reason that I remember it was because of the girl that prayed after me. I remember remember specifically tearing up as she was praying because the Holy Spirit was, was convicting me about the difference between praying about humility and actually praying with a humble heart. If conviction can come from beholding the humility of a fellow believer, how much more the humility of the King of glory? If you have a need this morning, whether your heart is burdened with the guilt of of your own sin, or if your heart is broken over another situation, may I encourage you this, this very morning to go to Jesus directly with your pain. The King of glory, the Lord over all creation, is powerful enough, He's powerful enough to do something about your specific situation. And he is, he is humble enough. He is gentle enough. He is meek enough to welcome you into his presence to discuss absolutely anything that is on your heart. Such is the glory of the character and the humility specifically of King Jesus. Behold, Behold the humility of King Jesus. It is both consoling and utterly convicting. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them. On the road. So the disciples bring the beasts of burden to Jesus, and as Doug O'Donnell puts it, the Son of God sat on the child of a donkey. One of the other gospel writers says that, that the young foal had never been ridden. And again, in a subtle way, behold the Lord of creation who can ride on an unbroken beast, and it follows his command. If a king approached a city riding on a war horse, you better prepare for battle. When a king approached a city riding on a donkey, it symbolized he was coming in peace. So here Jesus is signifying that at his first coming, and this is the first mention from Matthew that he came to Jerusalem, Here Jesus is signifying that at his first coming, he is coming, he's coming in peace. Even to those who have rebelled 
against him, who are by nature objects of wrath. Friend, this is such, such good news for sinners. A similar declaration went out at his birth. The angel's announcement was good news of great joy for all the people. And the multitude of angels proclaimed glory to God in the highest and on earth peace. Peace among those with whom he is pleased. He was announced as the Prince of Peace by the prophet Isaiah again 700 years before his birth. So if you're here today, and you've always kind of viewed God as an angry judge, behold the beauty of his plan to save you. Behold his tenderness and his his approachableness, his meekness, his attractiveness as a humble king. The father sent his son to earth to bring peace. He not only came to bring peace, he made peace through the blood of his cross. Colossians 1.20. Further, he himself is our peace. Ephesians 2.14. Luke adds that as Jesus approached the city, he wept over Jerusalem. And he declared, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. That way of peace Jesus longed for you to know, friend, I now proclaim to you. You can have peace with God this very hour if you will repent of your sin and embrace the peace offered through his Son. Behold, behold the tears of the Savior, of the Lord of glory. Behold his tears yearning to save sinners. The Father sending His Son to earth was not a declaration of war, but an offer of peace made in love. In this, the love of God was made visible among us that God sent His only Son into the world not to wage war against the world, to destroy it, which would have been a righteous thing to do, but that the world might live through him. 1 John 4, 9. So if you're here for the first time or here for the first time in a long time, I may not know anything else about you, but I know this. If your heart is unsettled within you, you, like the rest of us, you need peace with God. And that peace is freely offered to you through His Son, who is the Prince of Peace. So turn to Him. Turn to him even at this moment and be saved. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. As Jesus approaches the city, the people cry out with shouts of praise. And if you, if you synthesize the four gospel narratives about this, there's a throng coming to the city with Jesus. And there's a throng coming out of the city to meet Jesus when they hear that he is coming. And so this whole throng is moving into Jerusalem. 
These praises are a direct quote from Psalm 118, 25 through 26. Hosanna literally means save now. So it's, it's, it's a praise and it's a prayer asking the Lord to save them. The people are saying, as a direct quote from Psalm 118, 25 and 26, they are saying, save us, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But in those words, hear, hear the ancient dilemma that is an oh-so-modern dilemma as well. When we think of God's deliverance from oppression, we, just like the people of Jesus' day, assume that salvation equals success. But the way of the kingdom is not the way of the world. Remember where we are right now in the redemptive story. We are just days before Calvary. Jesus himself has told his followers what will happen to him upon his arrival in Jerusalem. And he has not been unclear about this. At least three very specific times, he has told them this very thing, and he's intimated this idea on multiple other occasions. Jesus himself has told his followers what is about to happen upon his arrival in Jerusalem. But even now, just days before Calvary, no one has yet connected the dots between Zechariah 9 and Isaiah 53. Zechariah 9 declares that God will save his people, that their king is coming, righteous and having salvation is he. The conquering king will reign from sea to sea and the Lord of hosts will protect them. These are glorious promises for the people of God. But no one, no one perceived that this conquering king is also the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. How can this king, greeted with shouts of joy, also be despised and rejected by men? How can the one promised to sit on the throne of David forever, how can he die? on an old rugged cross at the hand of Israel's enemies? The answer is that the way that he conquered actually came through his humility and suffering. Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham, the son of God, will indeed save his people from their greatest enemy. Namely, their own sin. But the man riding into Jerusalem on a donkey would defeat their greatest enemy in a way that no one yet understood. At least for another week or so in the storyline. As all of this begins to take place, people say, who is this? When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up saying, who is this? And the crowd said, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. You might have those words echoing in your ears. Can anything good come from Nazareth? I'm sure more than a few people laughed at this statement. But it's a true, it's a true answer. It's a right answer as far as it goes, but it's, it's nowhere complete. Matthew has already shown us clearly that Jesus is not just a prophet. Indeed, he is, but he is also a king in the line of his father, David. And next week, we will see that Jesus is also a priest as he comes to the temple and cleanses the temple before his father. Therefore, Jesus is a prophet. He is a priest, as we'll see next week. And he is a king. In other words, in this one man, 
is fulfilled all of the ministerial roles of the Old Testament. But even this is not the full answer. The crowds shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. We as the people of God can certainly join our voices to that chorus. But we also must join our voices with the host of heaven as we exult in the full revelation of the one who is both conquering king and suffering servant. The one who has come is coming again. To him we sing a new song. Worthy are you to take the scroll and open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Our declaration as the people of God will forever be worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. So then, who is Jesus? He is the lamb who was slain And because of who he is, he is worthy of our worship forever. Would you pray with me? Father, would you help us to respond in the way that is right to respond based just on this particular scene? That when Jesus reveals his glory, when the Holy Spirit helps us to see that, the right response of people, indeed of all creation, is to to worship him. So would you cause our hearts now to swell, that is overflow, with amazement and awe and thankfulness for who Jesus is and what he has accomplished on our behalf. Father, we, with one voice, say worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive honor and blessing and praise forever. Inhabit the praises of your people now, we ask in his glorious name. Amen.